at the end of the year, there's a lot that we can be doing. There's a lot of stuff that we've got to finish up, but the end of the year also is the perfect time to have students start thinking back through the year. Think about how much they've grown. Think about the skills that they've developed and think about the things that they've been thinking about through the whole year and be able to kind of pull it all together. This is the best time to do this. And as we're doing remote learning too, this is still a wonderful time to be able to do this. And of course, as always, we've got lots and lots of ideas to share with you to get you thinking about student reflection to end the year. Yeah, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. My name is Matt Miller. I'm the author of Ditch That Textbook. And um, alongside me to talk about reflection today, we got Holly Clark. Holly, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. I'm Holly from the Infused Classroom series in San Diego. And I'm so happy that we have someone from already from Brooklyn. And we um, are not at our normal time because we were going to do it yesterday. And I was like, Matt. It's Mother's Day. <laughs> we better not do this. But yeah, we're yeah. coming up to a different time. So if we are watching this on um, replay, thanks for joining us. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so if you are here live and are watching, we're super excited to have you along. Please do drop your name, your location, your role, any of that stuff you want to share with us into the chat so that we can shout you out and say hello. And um, in this episode, we're going to be talking about some things that you can be doing regarding remote learning. But this will even work, of course, in the face-to-face -face classroom too, related to reflection and having students uh, reflect at the end of the year. And, you know, this seems to be, I'd say, you know, what we're really talking about here is metacognition, you know, thinking about your thinking. If you want to get Holly excited, you start <laughs> to drop that word metacognition and she'll get all like, all giddy. And, um, but that's, I mean, that's really what we're talking about. And the end of the year really is an excellent time to do that, to be able to just stop for a second. It's so easy to skip right past this step, but just to stop for a second and think about what have we learned? Yeah. What does it mean? Why is it important? But also what have we learned about ourselves as learners? And Holly, I know you probably agree with me on this, that this is, this really is a good time to do this thinking about your thinking. Well, and we can do it now because we don't have these tests that are looming over us. We're, and right now, actually, we'd be t done with the test and this becomes really important. So I see in the schools that I work with at this time, people are playing movies. They're showing the movie of Star Wars. Oh, yeah. They're doing whatever. And I'm like, oh, but you could be reflecting. And I'm going to show you some examples today that are really, really strong ways to have students reflect. And I'm going to hopefully talk about like the why, because uh, we I've learned some lessons from around the globe of people who are doing it and what it's really done to their scores. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, I keep looking off to the side because I want to share this to my own Facebook group. But for some reason, Matt, it doesn't have the share button. So I'll let it go. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I was going to give you a little bit of time as we say hello to the folks that are yeah. that are joining with us. So if you want to tinker with it a little bit, we'll give Holly a second to be able to share. And so we want to make sure that we say hello to Reba from Dallas, Texas. Familiar face there. Good to see you. Hello to Tanya here again from Minnesota. Thank you for that. Making sure that I pronounce that right. There's our friend Dalton from North Carolina. Good to see you. Christy is here from Frisco, Texas. Welcome, welcome. Les is here from Southern California. Wondering about how to end the year with student uh, reflection. So, hey, Les is in the right place. So that's good. Rosalina is here from Clovis again. Good to see so many familiar faces. Claudette is here. She's from Houston. She didn't want to watch this on, on Mother's Day either. So it's probably a good thing that we rescheduled, right? So we've got Tracy here from Western New York. Good to see her. Tatiana. That's it. That explains why I originally had yesterday on my calendar. Yep, that's right. We snuck it in on you. Heather's here from Georgia. Oh, there's Les again. Melanie is here from North Carolina. Another regular. Good to see you. Lisa from Newport, Rhode Island. Good to see you too. Melanie is here from Orange, Texas. Ready for my new rabbit hole obsession. She was here for our, uh, our templates one last time. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's good. Um, I've gone so, down that rabbit hole. I made a bunch of templates, Matt. That's the next thing I'm going to put out. I What do we start? Oh, no. Nice. Nice. That's right. In fact, I've got a new post on the Ditch That Textbook blog about PowerPoint templates as well. So I need to drop the link in so you all can check it out. Um, Stu says that she's the tech lead for a building of 750 students, parents, yeah. staff, teaches 23 computer science classes. Oh, my goodness. 
Um, Reba, instructional designer, educational consultant from Dallas. And who else have we got here? Victor's here from Colorado Springs. Alan is here from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Good to see you. Rick from Pennsylvania. Jen from New Jersey and Josh Harris, Joshua Harris. So happy I caught you live. He's from Ohio. I was thinking of a different Joshua Harris. Um, I have to get to class soon. Glad to be on for a couple of minutes. Hey, we'll take you as long as we can get you. So, all right. Very good. So Holly, yeah. reflection at the end of the year. What do you think? So I think, um, I think we have to be really careful with this and as, uh, and I'll bring up the um, slide deck in a second, but we want to remember that some kids have had kind of a, a rough last six weeks. Some, you know, it's just been new and novel and they've adjusted, but we don't know what, what's happening at kids' homes. So to go like, let's reflect on everything is something we don't want to do, but we want to, we want to still value reflection because it is so important in understanding ourselves as learners and people. And I wish that somebody, maybe even it could have been my parents here, who would have taught me to stop and reflect on some of the choices I was making in life. And um, we can do that with learning. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And not only should we be doing it, but people like ISTE standards tell us we should do it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, um, if you want to just pull up the uh, slide deck. Mm -hmm. There we go. And um, I'm just going to start talking about this, Matt. And anytime you want to jump in, just talk real loud because I'll be over at that um, particular uh, um, screen. And I will say before Holly jumps in here real quick, as we're going through this, please, please, please do share your own thoughts and ideas related to this. If you yes. see something that we're talking about and you've done something like it before, tell us about it so that we can shout you out on the screen. If you've got questions, please drop those in. I'm going to be monitoring those comments. Holly's going to do the, the majority of the heavy lifting in this one. So I'll be able to interact with you in the comments and share your ideas. So we feel like we're better together and we want to showcase your stuff too. So if you're watching live, mm -hmm. please do, please do shoot us some comments while we go. And things that you're doing, because I'm going to give five things that you can do, but there are so many. And um, the first thing I want to start with, Matt, here, and, I, and I'm and i just going to leave this with the, with the slides on the side. But as you just had your book, which congratulations on the success of um, your new book. So if, uh, if you guys haven't gotten that, you might want to get it. But I... Um, I also am an author and I've been writing the Chromebook Infused Classroom and I'm using this sort of framework that you see here to really talk about now that you have Chromebooks, how do you put students at the center of their learning? And that's why I believe, I mean, not all administrators did it, some got it so they could take tests, but good administrators got it so that students would be at the center of their learning. And I talk about how to do that. But the last thing I talk about in this kind of framework is the reflection process. And so that's what we're going to zoom in on today is like after we've done all the learning, it's not complete yet. And we know this, it's not just coming from me, it's coming from all kinds of uh, places, but ISTE student standards, um, and that I've just put ISTE standard, it should really say the student standards because they have teacher standards and computer uh, technology standards, but it, it, the first one is called the empowered learner. And the first one and the first one of the first one, which is 1A, says that students um, need to articulate and set personal learning goals. And from those learning goals, develop strategy, leveraging technology to achieve them and reflect on the learning process itself to improve their own learning outcomes. And so one thing that's really important here and part of my framework is that students have to set a goal. Like just coming into the, to, uh, the classroom one day and saying, we're gonna learn about castles because guess what? In sixth grade, we learn about the feudal system and we're learning about castles doesn't let the students have a have a place in their learning. So we want to ask them, you know, maybe when we go into the middle ages, what are your learning goals? Like, what do you want to take out of this? And it doesn't need to just be like, I want to know how many rooms were in a castle because you're never going to know that. But how it is that you learn and how it is that you're going to improve on your own personal learning journey. And when we don't ask that as students, we're leaving out just such an important soft skill. Mm -hmm. And I understand, like, I had all all of the history standards that I had to run through and language arts as well. But I have to take that time. And if I don't, I'm missing really something very important. 
Mm -hmm. I wanted to also throw in there, you were just asking, I just put it up on the screen down below. How will you improve on your learning journey? What are your learning goals? I think, you know, for me, I've always thought that's so important because it feels like, you know, in some of the traditional ways that we teach that education is something that is done to students, that is inflicted on students. And when they start to take more responsibility of it. And I don't say irresponsibility, like quit being so irresponsible, but like when they get to play a part in it, I think is what I really mean. When they get to make some decisions, you know, make some choices and kind of guide it on their own, it becomes something that they own and they treasure and they value more than if a teacher is just telling them what to do all the time. And so I really, really love that question. How will you improve on your learning journey? Yeah. Yeah. And I used to do this activity with my seventh graders, Matt, where I would give them a ball, a small ball, and I would say, make a goal. And they'd make this lofty goal. I'm going to learn how to write better. And I'd be like, that's like such a lofty goal. And I'd put a big circle at the end of the classroom and I'd say, see if you can hit that. And they couldn't. And I said, okay, now make little goals. Like I'm going to improve my sentence structure. I'm going to add better words. I'm going to, and each of those little goals added to the big big lofty goal of um, being a better writer. And then I would have them throw the ball and they could make those little targets. And I said, we can't, and I tried to teach them that we can't make these big learning goals without looking at the little ones and then reflecting on those. And I started to do that. Now, if anyone knows anything about me, I don't, I'm not a journaler. I don't want to like, I got, I don't have time. I'm doing all kinds of stuff, but I made myself reflect on my teaching each day. And that is the biggest change maker of anything I ever did. And I think that my national board certification was one of those big things, but my personal reflection every day at the end of the day as to what I had done and what I could do better changed my teaching. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. And I feel like you know there that that's something that either we just don't make time for or we just think that we don't have time for, but I'm, you know, I'm the same way. I heard somebody say once that we don't improve because of practice and experience. We prove, we improve based on the thoughts that we have on our experience. Like that's how we move forward, which I thought was really good. There've been a couple of good comments that have come in too. Yeah. I just put this one up from Dalton a second ago. He says, without a goal, students have no idea where they're going. Think about an athlete. Mm -hmm. They grow their skill set by setting a goal to reach and students are the same way. And, but we don't do this because, you know, like as a middle school teacher, I watch as like people come in for 45 minutes and they're like, I don't have time for goals. If you don't set the goals, how can there be the solidification of learning? And I yeah. see Les asks, um, how many goals do you think you should set? Well, here's what I started to do at the end uh, when I was with the students. I would, and I don't mean the end, but when I was like, in it every day. Now I'm teaching teachers and I'm, I'm co-teaching with people, but I would sit down with the, um, with the standards for uh, California. And I would say, here are our standards for the, the thing, um, for this unit. I want you to find five that speak to you. And then we would sit down and have conversations in small groups, break those up and ask yourself why. Why do I want to know this? And and I will, and I'm going to show you a little later on some thinking routines that I use to get them to unpack these standards and really get at goals. And um, it wasn't easy, but it got easier, just yeah. like everything, just yes. like lifting weights. Yes, it got easier. Yes, yes, that's right. Totally agree with that. I love this comment that we got from Gina earlier. She says, giving students choice and letting them drive is crucial. Oftentimes, the kids have the best ideas for how oh. to achieve the learning goals. So Ruben Puntadora, this reminds me of this. So he does Sammer, and you probably have heard of him and maybe don't know his name or know his name, but I got to have dinner with him one night. And I said, Ruben, like, how do I get students to like reflect or um, re, re, what's it? Redefinition. And he said, don't you worry about it. Students will take you there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, boom. Like, yes. So um, anyway, yeah. so, uh, I'm going to go back to those slides and, mm -hmm. um, and, and I saw someone asked if I can share this at the end when we're kind of um, ending, I'll try and get a link up. If not, I can put them on Twitter and also I can put a link in a blog post. So I gave Matt um, a, a link to the blog post that goes with this presentation. Mm -hmm. And um, 
if you go there, I'll, I'll put a link to this in there as well. But one of the things that we need to do for why reflection is we need to invite students and there's some notes down here if you get the um, if you get the slide deck, but we need to invite them to reflect orally and we need to do it written. And I actually am a bigger fan of doing it orally. And you all know that I'm going to say I would do this all the time in Flipgrid. And this is why when Flipgrid came out, I was like, what? This is what I've been waiting for, because I used to do this, Matt. I used to have kids reflect um, and, and someone gave me like a worksheet I made in back in 1996 or whatever. I made a copy of the worksheet and I would be like, so what do you think you did right? What would you change this year? And every time I passed them out, because I didn't, I was a new teacher. I didn't know what I was doing. The kids were like, well, and they'd fill out some sentence to make me happy. And then I learned about technology. And so you know what I did, Matt? I took that horrible worksheet and I put it into a Google form. And I thought uh -huh. I was doing great stuff. Yeah, it that's was, right. Mic drop right there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was the same not important answers. But mm -hmm. when I had, finally, I used Vocaroo first, which recorded a student's responses. But when I had them go on to Flipgrid and they had to think about it and talk about it, and then I had a Flipgrid for each kid. They had their own grid that was their reflection of learning grid. And they would talk about stuff over time. And then I would say, okay, go back to one video, watch what you said then and reflect on it in this next video. I was able to layer what was happening with reflection. And I had them look at, and bring and now on Flipgrid, they could bring it onto the screen. These were my goals. And uh, did I meet those? And what would I do differently next time? And we're going to talk about some things I had them do around that. But also it becomes this multi-layered um, approach where or multi-dimensional approach where I asked them to look for patterns. And I couldn't do that in those worksheets or in those Google Forms. Um, but I can if I'm just letting them free flow their thoughts and talk to me. So you're going to see some of that coming up in um, some examples. But the thing that's really important to me, Matt, and I always talk about is I feel like as a teacher, we're creating recipes like this great recipe of, um, oh, you can see my thing down there doesn't have it spelled right. But anyway, um, has the, we create these great recipes of learning. And when we don't put in the reflection, we're not adding the salt. And have you ever not added a salt mm. to a dish? It's no bueno. Yeah. Oh, like, you're right. Yeah. It's not good. Like you, everything needs the salt. And I found this and I put it in here because I found it interesting. We put salt on things because water molecules come up as you're cooking and dilute the flavor. And when you put salt, it keeps the water from coming in and diluting stuff. And I th thought that was interesting. Like we're adding the salt, but we don't know why. Yeah. And um, we need to really think about that in terms of learning. We need to add that last ingredient that kind of helps bring the flavors of learning to life. That's brilliant. That is so brilliant. I totally, totally love that. I didn't even think about, I've, I've seen all sorts of like, you know, I like to talk about how whenever you're creating lessons, you're like the chef and you're the one who puts the ingredients together to make it exactly the way you want. But that that connection to the salt that like totally takes it to another level. Like and I you know, think every teacher I work with, I'm like, did you add the salt? And then yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Love that. Love that. That's great. Um, can we take just a second look at a couple comments? Yeah. All right. Very good. So here's another one from Gina. She says, I ask the kids to reflect on lessons, websites, the way I teach. That's brave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's very brave. Yeah. What our classroom needs more or less of kids are empowered by being able to reflect on experiences. And, you know, as I did that too, Gina, like kids would say something and it, sometimes it wasn't always nice. And I was like, Argh. and then after a minute, I was like, you know what? I think they're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I had to kind of check my ego a little. Right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, here's one from Debbie layering reflections. Yes. Peer interaction revisions of goals. Oh, there we go. Revising the goal, not just setting the goal, yeah. but revising it and next steps, getting them to take action. Love that Debbie. Absolutely. So yeah, those are, those are some of the, we had one from Dalton. Also, I love the idea of letting students go back and look at their reflection videos. They can see personal growth when they hear it from themselves. And see, I think this is such a cool part of the year. If you've been doing reflection throughout the year, or if you've had students 
showing what they know on a regular basis because then they can go back through it. And I think, you know, we were talking about Flipgrid earlier. Flipgrid is such a cool way to do this because they can hear it in their own voice and their own words from the beginning of the year. They watch that at the beginning of the year and then they watch it as it slowly evolves over time. And sometimes there is this like amazing metamorphosis of their skills and their thinking, which is so cool. And if we don't take a second to think about it, we miss all of that. It's just, it's gone. Yeah. And, um, and it comes back to, so, and I don't know if there's any more that you want to share or we can come back to them, but it comes back to this kind of fact I figured out as I was traveling. Um, so PISA tests, which are international achievement tests. Um, I've, I've said this a couple times on these Canadians always, uh, do way better than we do on those tests. Uh, and they're a test in reading, math, and science. And we're getting better recently. In 2016, we were like 37th in the world. Now we're up in the top 20. Um, so things are getting better. But I, I would go to Canada and I would think about why are they doing better than us? They have a very diverse society. And so it's not around that. And I found it was around because they have a reflective practice. And if you go to British mm -hmm. Columbia, their new, um, and British Columbia, by the way, to me has the best standards that there are in the world. Um, their standards are, ha include this and so does Ontario. And so um, that reflective part, I think brings up the learning the way salt brings up the flavor. And um, so they use something in Canada a lot more than we do, although this is not necessarily a Canadian thing. They use this idea of for, of, and as assessment. And I feel like in the U.S. we do a lot of, oops, I didn't mean to move that, a lot of the of. So for assessment is like this um, checks for understanding, of is the summative, like I want to um, find out. Uh, what you learned, and then I'm going to use that as a grade. But in the U.S., we don't really do the as, the reflective process. And what that looks like and the difference is, is that the role of the teacher shifts from being the person who's giving out information to having kids use reflection as learning, as learning, which is important, and to ask those guiding questions and help kids level up to be able to reflect on their own. And um, so... This is why, um, like, I think we need to really remember that this is a form of assessment and shouldn't mm -hmm. be graded per se, but should be part of this process. So I want to show you something. And I, we haven't tried this before, Matt, me showing a video, but I mm -hmm. want you to look at this video and I want you to decide, is this for, like, for learning? Is this... Um, is this a check for understanding? Is this an of learning, which is summative at the end of the unit? Or is this a reflective one? And I mean, I am using it here, so it's probably going to be one. But um, this is a third grader who is doing an end of the year reflection and she's using Google Slides. It could be PowerPoint and Screencastify. You're going to see it as soon as I start it. And I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm only going to play like 40 seconds, but I want you to look at her reflective process. And as she talks, I want you to look at her slide and see if she's reading from her slide or she's just going off the cuff and telling you what she's learned. So this is from an art class. So let's see if this works. Oh, I'm gonna have to make this. Oh, it did work now in the window. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Rachel Schwarzman. Can you hear it? And today I'm going to be showing you my art portfolio for 2013 through 2014. First, I made a photo mosaic. I love this art project. I took many, many, many types of magazines that had different textures or different different shades of color red. I glued them together and then made this love sign. I love this love sign. I always see it when I go to the city. And a lot of, I used my computer to actually sketch out the design. I looked at it and then I tried my best to do it. So next is my religious or. So I'm gonna stop because um, I think you can see in that first slide, she talked about her learning. She wrote something on a slide, but she didn't go and she didn't just read word for word, which I have seen a lot when people reflect. And now at the end of the school year, she's summarizing everything up and she is talking her way through what she accomplished. And I just love this. And 
it's as easy as Google Slides and Screencastify, right? Yeah. Hey, I wanted to throw something in on that too, that did you hear, you know, not only did she talk about what she had done, but could you hear the emotion in her yeah. voice? She yeah. said, there, were, there was one line she said that stuck with me and she said, I loved this project. Yeah. And, like really hear it. Like she loved it. This was the, fr this was the one she put at the beginning of her video because she loved it the most. And that's the stuff that we miss out on. If a, if we don't do the reflection and B, if we don't let them, what Holly press <laughs> record, record. Yes. in our next slide. And if we're trying to find these five ideas of how we can start this reflective process, hopefully your reflective process gets better than some of these ideas. But this is how I kind of started it with my classroom because I didn't want to give those handouts anymore. I didn't want to go to the risograph machine at the time and um, make these handouts. So I did these things and they include, um, I had students just do at the time, either digital or analog, doesn't matter, but a diary to themselves or this video journal I talked about in Flipgrid where they deconstructed what was happening. And I used to do it on Fridays. On Fridays, they knew that they were gonna look at their learning over the week. So they knew that this was coming and they were thinking about their learning the entire week because they needed something to say. And that kind of um, that kind of routine really built our reflective process. Uh, practice in that class. And even today, some of those students, when we first, I was like all in on this for a couple years, those students are now adults. And I hear from them on Facebook all the time, like Miss Clark, I was reflecting on Friday and I have my, my children reflect on Friday. And I'm like, wow, like when it makes it home to the dinner table and now their kids dinner table, that's, that's huge. Hard. That means yeah. it's working. Yeah. And to be 30 whatever now, and you are still talking to me about this reflective process, nothing mm -hmm. can make me happier. Yes, yes. Um, uh, real quick, I wanted, to, I wanted to throw a couple of comments in here real fast. This was a question, and I think this is from Donna Lee. I just mentioned this back to her how much I love that she was asking this. I think that she totally gets the power of this just by asking these questions. She said, is this retrieval practice metacognition? Like... I think that it's both. I think that you get the power of two very effective practices by doing this. Because of course, retrieval practice is when you recall something that you've learned later on down the road. Like it's like you've taken you've disconnected from it, you've kind of like forgotten about it, sort of, and then you come back down the road and you try to recall it. That's powerful for long-term learning, but you also get the metacognition piece where you get to think through it. So it's like it's kind of doubly powerful. So to her, I answered and I said, oh, you dropped two pedagogical bombs right there. I totally love that right. comment. I want to take that retrieval practice further. So retrieval okay. practice, when you take when you do it at the end of a unit or as a reflective piece, you're doing something that is called cognitive struggle. And you're sitting there and you're having to think, oh my gosh, what did I learn? What was I going through? And that cognitive struggle, cognitive sciences tell us, is what solidifies learning for kids. So if it's just retrieval practice of like recall uh, the three capitals of um, Midwestern states or something, then there's not a, there can be a little cognitive struggle there, but this kind of reflective uh, retrieval practice embeds in that cognitive struggle. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, okay, I'll go back. I like that someone put risograph machine. Yep, that's how old I am. Um, so anyway, um, I also started to have students write a short letter to themselves because I wasn't, I, I needed not to always do the same thing. And the, and the letter is pretty much the same, but they didn't see it in that way. So I would say, okay, write a letter to yourself as we go into the next unit. Let's say we just did the Civil War and we're going into Reconstruction. What what would you give yourself like, and you could put it with number three as well. What advice would you give yourself? What things do you, would you want to say to yourself? And so just having them write a simple letter to themselves brought it into a different dimension. And honestly, um, I got the most out of number one with the Flipgrid, but some students need to write. They don't want to be in video all the time. They're like, Miss Clark, I'm off with the Flipgrid. So um, that was a way to kind of change things up. Also, the idea of sentence starters for students who are young, like um, in the in the blog post, I have like, I, um, I 
what I did best was, things like that. But we're going to talk in a minute about the thinking routines that come from um, visible thinking from Ron Richer and his crew and using those as reflective pieces. And then, of course, the press record, which is the whole Flipgrid thing, like have students explain their learning because now that you've done that along the way, they can go back and listen to that and say, here I am at the end of the unit. Hmm. Yeah, I was getting it there, but somewhere along the way, I got off track. What happened? Let me think about that. Or I yeah. did. So, um, so as we look at this, uh, reflection is commenting on the process to better understand it, and we can use apps like Flipgrid, Book Creator, where they can keep a long-term journal. I do do a lot of that actually. Um, Seesaw, where they can put it in a folder and reflect, use it as their reflective piece later. And of course, Adobe Spark, which is this one, which we've shown in here before, but this is a poetry anthology. A kid was did her poetry, um, brought it into this. You could see here's her number, the stars. And then she comes below it and reflects on it. Here's why I did this. And we can use things like this is Adobe Spark page to have this reflective journal that they do at the end or like Screencastify that we just saw. And then uh, we can also um, look at some of these thinking routines. This is my favorite, Matt. I probably overuse this. <laughs> For good reason, I'd say. Yeah, I love it. Like I used to think maybe the middle ages were so and so and so and so, but now I think, oh my gosh, they led up to this place where we could have um, uh, a, a, like human growth in our Renaissance. And so I like kids to do that. I used to think, now I think. And um, I really help help them through this. Like the first time they do it, it's very, it's not, it's just a sentence that doesn't mean much. But I mm -hmm. take the time to talk, to question, to ask why, and to do, um, to kind of layer in some of these other thinking routines, like step inside is a perspective, taking a perspective on something. So even your own perspective, like what did you do well and what didn't you do well? And let's really um, look at those things more deeply. And you can even unpack it with layers. Like I did this, which impacted this, like I didn't get my work done. And then it, it impacted like, a, and then I'm behind my whole group's mad at me or, I got my work done. The group loved me. I was the hero of the group. And you can look at it in the layers um, thinking routine. Mm -hmm. And finally, this is like the most famous thinking routine, this see, think, wonder. What about if you put that on top of, I see that I got a B, I think, whatever. And I wonder if I had done not watched this one TV show <laughs> or whatever, if I might have done better. So it's um, adding these and giving kids um, really diversity around their reflection. Yeah. So that's just some starters. Yeah. That's good. That's, those are, I mean, those are all concrete, practical things that we can start using right away. And I think especially I, I put this comment up earlier from Reba. She says, I'm sending all of these ideas to my teachers who are teaching online in order to enhance their students' current experience with them. And I think, you know, giving students the opportunity to do this, maybe if we're face to face in a classroom, maybe some of this sort of organically happens whenever we're there. I've got to think that it's got to be so much harder to get to reflection for students on their own whenever they're at home, if they don't have somebody to guide them through it. And these are like super simple, easy protocols to have students kind of think through this themselves, which actually leads us to this question. This question yeah. came in from Monica. I don't know if you saw this. She says, all great ideas, but, and this is a very valid but here, how do teachers respond to this efficiently when they have 125 middle schoolers? individual narratives aren't really an option for everything now and even rubrics are taking so long so any tricks for remote learning feedback or shortcuts so what would you say to monica holly first of all i'd say to monica how lucky you only have 125 when i did this i had 175 seventh graders and um i had to layer this i had to do um like one week i focused on period one and then on week two i focused on period 
two or whatever, because I couldn't get to 175, but I didn't want to give up. So I had come from a school where I had like 25, I had two periods of 25. It was this private school situation and we got all reflective and I didn't want to give it up for these kids just because California state puts a bunch of them in a class. So um, I just found a way to layer it. I also like had them, um, like I picked one Flipgrid video, but I had them looking at their own. And so I kind of took the onus off me. And I'll be honest, don't tell any kids here. Sometimes I didn't watch them, but I acted like I did. <laughs> right, right. It's your secret. This is a safe place, Holly. It's okay. <laughs> but I had 175 yeah. of them. I get that. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important point. And, you know, when we go back to some of these visible thinking routines that you were sharing earlier, the the see, think, wonder, and the first I thought, then I thought, like, if we give them some of these prompts too, just because, you know, sometimes we can give them these prompts and give them the opportunity to reflect on their own. And guess what? They will make progress even if we don't read it, even if we don't grade it and put it in the grade book and all of that, because all we're really doing is we're walking them through a thinking path. And if we give them the opportunity to think, that's you know, that's that's really the the best gift out of all of this um, reflection, I think, is giving them an opportunity to see the world differently and think about it differently. And um, yeah, if you have 125 students or 175 students and you can't get to all of them, still go ahead and do it anyway and give them the opportunity to think through these things because the, the power isn't in the comments that you leave back to them. The power is in the thinking that the kids do themselves. Am I right? Yeah, and I used to say, is there one student in here you trust that you could work with and that they could look at yours and you guys could have a discussion around it? I didn't want to force them. And some some students were like, I don't want to share anything. And I'm like, cool, don't share. But if you have a partner you could work with, that would be great. And I also knew that Christy needed me to look at hers. Do you know what I mean? And, and Sonia, she was good. So I just, I did the craft of teaching with that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Let's jump into the comments just a little bit more. We got one from Nate, my co-author of the, the book, Don't Ditch That Tech. And he says, I think metacognition goes back to depth over breadth, which is better for remote learning. Um, I thought that was a really good point. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I would want to, if I had a 125 kids, um, I'd want to also ask them right now, like what worked for you in this remote learning? I would want to be armed with what things worked for them, what things didn't so that in November or whatever month that this comes back around, I have all of this information that I can look at and see what worked and what didn't. Don't mm -hmm. miss that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Gina says eventually those thinking paths will transfer over into different subject areas or areas of their lives. That's that transfer, right, Holly? That's all I want. Please. Uh -huh. we're, we're, this is about lifelong learning. And think about how great it would be if people today had a reflective process. And when they decide, mm, I don't really want to wear a mask, if they thought, let me think about that. Who's mm -hmm. that reflecting? If I do that, what message does that send? You know, like, like, these kinds of reflective processes are important. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. Debbie says the power isn't in the comment you leave for them, but in their thinking. Love that. Yeah. Um, Melissa says, this is why I like to use Google Forms and the spreadsheets to help look at it in one place. That whole giving them an opportunity to reflect, they type it into a Google Form and then you get to see all of it in a spreadsheet. That's, um, that's good stuff. Back in the day, I just took the um, questions that were on a worksheet and put them in a Google Form. We're better now. We know mm -hmm. to put like, you know, write yourself a letter and, you know. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, Melanie says, I think having the kids go through this thinking process is the end goal. And as long as kids are doing this thinking, whether or not the teacher always reads it or views each response is beside the point. And I think if we join, I think ideally, you know, Holly, you were, you got this in the private school that you, you worked in. Ideally, if we get to join them in the thinking process and, you know, kind of partner up, sidle up next to them and, and get to talk through it. That's probably ideal, but at least giving them the prompts where they can do the, the thinking is better than nothing at all. Right. 
Yeah. And Matt, you know, when I talk to people about Flipgrid and how they're using it, I never hear anyone talk about how they're using private student grids. Like each student should have their own reflective grid. It's a beautiful mm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Monica was happy with our response to that thing. And thank you, Monica, for asking that question. I thought that was so, you know, those are the questions that we've got to deal with that, you know, you've, these are the struggles. And if we, if we can't talk about that, then what are we doing? You know? So, um, yeah, we've got, we've got a couple of other quick comments. Holly, do you have more that you want to get to? No, that was it. That was just like okay. a starter kit. And then we have, and you probably already put it up the blog post that goes with it, which I'll add these, um, slides to. Yeah. And I can, actually yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Let me get to a couple of these other comments because they're so good. And Debbie says, if other students can comment on their work, then it's elevated to another level. Yes, absolutely. Because what that is now, see, they're doing the reflection on their own. And if we can't get to it, then if they have somebody else, you know, and of course, this also deals with, you know, the, the level of trust and responsibility of the students that you have. But if they're able to effectively give each other a little bit of peer feedback, now, all of a sudden, that whole trying to grade more than 100 students stuff, you know, that they start to get feedback from other sources other than the teacher. And that's, that's really big, too. Um, I just put the link in the private chat for you to put up, Matt, and then I just have to go back over to the slides and actually share them. So give me a second on that, everyone. But um, uh, I want to say that uh, just make sure because I've had this problem. Just make sure that you okay with the students because I've had students come to me crying like um, uh, I don't want them to see my thing. So we, I love students partnering up. Just okay yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's super super important. Totally agree with that. A um, couple more of these real quick. Dalton says I've asked my students. I ask my students multiple reflection questions during this time period, not only to help me but other educators at my school as well. That's a good one. Um, Denise, oh my goodness, there's Denise Douglas. Uh, by the way, congratulations on being elected to the Q board to Denise. She says, um, we are living in historic times. Student reflections will become primary source documents in the future. Yes. Interesting that she mentions that. Yeah, that's, that is, that's so true. I, I wish that we all had... Um our students reflecting on this. And the only reason I haven't pushed it more is because some kids are not living in the best situation. And I would yeah. really ask them to reflect on like this whole uh, COVID-19, but for the kids, you know, are, are living an okay life at home. It's such an important thing to document. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, one more real quick. Um where did this one go? Here we go. Something else from Gina. She says, I incorporate a feedback reflection piece in my weekly Google Forms check-ins. How the students are reacting and learning now gives incredible insight into the kids' learning journeys. That's that's cool. I wish yeah. she could like, present next week because I would love to hear what her students are saying. Hmm, we might be able to make that happen. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to see if we can get a hold of Gina. That would be really good. So, all right. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, we were getting a couple of comments in the, um, about the slides needing permission. So Holly will yeah, change the permission. Done. Done. Yeah. She's, okay. Already done. So, um, so anyway, there is that link in the comments that, um, has the link. In fact, I'll go ahead and put it there to Holly's slides for this presentation. If you're interested in getting those, we also have her, um, blog post that's about this. Yeah. It's the, it's the same thing, infuse.link slash reflect. So just infuse.link slash reflect if you want to dig a little deeper into all of this too. So this has been a fantastic video. Definitely fantastic because we've had some really, really good participation from the comments here. So um, if you joined us live, thanks so much for being a part of this. Um, if you're on the replay, I hope that you got a lot of use out of this too. If you like these videos and would like to see more videos like these and including the live videos, please do hit subscribe to the Ditch That Textbook YouTube channel. And then we're on Facebook too. Some of you are watching this on Facebook. So um, if you're on Facebook, you can search for Ditch That Textbook to be able to find my Facebook page. And Holly, what's yours again? Uh, Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Infused Classroom. But if you just look for Infused Classroom, um, you'll find it. But I want to say someone said 
in the chat that their their kids are not motivated and that's something that we're going to be talking about in the future and matt has yeah. a whole book about it he just released but um but we're going to be adding that coming up soon yes absolutely definitely so again thank you so much for joining us we had a blast hanging out with all of you in the video and we will see you on the next one so take care